Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and today I want to tell you about a saint that you probably haven't heard of before because she's pretty new to the list of canonized saints. Her name is Saint Laura Montoya Upegi, and she was canonized in 2013 by Pope Francis himself. And a fun fact about Saint Laura is that she is the very first saint to be canonized from the country of Colombia. So to all of my Colombian listeners, if you're tuning in, you can be proud of Saint Laura from coming from your country, the very first Colombian saint. Well, Saint Laura was born in 1874. She was born in the city of Jericho, Colombia, and she had one older sister and one younger brother. So a middle child right in the middle of the family. Her father was a doctor and their family was a very devout family. They would pray the rosary together often and they were very happy together. But the country of Colombia at that time was going through a pretty serious and bloody civil war. And Laura's father was called into service in this war. And so Laura's mother had to take care of the three children all by herself while her husband was gone until she received the terrible news that her husband, Laura's father, had been killed. Now, Laura was only two years old at this point, so still very young. She probably never even had a memory of what her father was like. Now, the Montoya family had not only lost a beloved father and a beloved husband, but on a more practical level, they had lost their entire source of of income. There was no one there to make money for them anymore. And so the debts began to pile up and the family eventually had to sell their whole house, almost all their possessions, and move in with their maternal grandparents who took them in. Now, despite the fact that her husband's murder had literally destroyed so much of her life, Laura's mother made a point of praying for her husband's killer by name every single day in the family rosary. Can you imagine that? The whole family would gather together and pray for the man who had took the life of their father. So Laura grew up watching her mother model this for her. And she learned from her mom the lesson to forgive those who had hurt her and to pray for her enemies because that's what she saw her mom doing for her husband's killer. Now growing up fatherless without that dad influence in her life really wounded Laura's heart. You can imagine what that would have been like. She struggled with abandonment issues through her whole life because she didn't have that father's love that she craved and that she needed growing up. Having a father is an extremely important part of a child's development and she didn't have that. Her mother certainly did the best she could. She was a very loving woman, a very holy woman, as you can see from the fact that she was praying for her husband's killer. But Laura really felt the lack of her father growing up. And she also felt the rejection of her relatives. These were family members who never made her feel like part of the family, but actually made her feel like a burden on their grandparents' charity and kind of judged her because of that. And she felt that keenly. She was a very sensitive child. And her experience of rejection and abandonment, it only got worse when her family no longer had enough money to afford to take care of all of the children. And so Laura, when she was only seven years old, was sent away from her family, away from her siblings, away from her mom, to an orphanage, which was run by her aunt, who was a nun. Now you can imagine what this would have been like for Laura. She's hurt even more emotionally because she feels like everyone who should have loved her, her father, her mother, her family, were all being systematically stripped away from her for one reason or another. And she felt like an orphan. She felt alone. She felt like no one wanted her around. No one would ever love her. Completely rejected. And this was what she bore for a lot of her childhood. Until one day when she was eight years old, she was outside in nature, which she loved to be in. And she was watching a row of ants carrying supplies back to their ant hill. And while she was watching them, she was struck, even as a little child, by just how ordered they were. They were all organized, doing whatever ants were supposed to do. And then she had an insight. 
She had an insight into how God had created all of these ants, all of this order. These little tiny creatures had been created by the almighty God. And that this same God who had designed these little ants had also created her. And when she looked at the order that she saw in nature, she looked at her own life and she thought to herself, I'm not an accident. Even though I feel rejected by those in my life who should have loved me, I am not unloved and I am not rejected by God. I'm not an inconvenience to God, she realized. She realized that God hadn't rejected her, that he was her father who loved her, even when it seemed like all of her other family members had abandoned her. She writes in her journal later about this experience, and she wrote, It was as if I was struck by a lightning bolt. It was a knowledge of God and his grandeur, so profound, so magnificent, so loving, that today, after so much study and learning, I still know no more about God than I knew back then. And this experience that she had just from watching ants and having this experience of the greatness of God, her creator and his love for her stayed with her for the rest of her life. And in this knowledge of God, she began to have her heart heal from the rejection and abandonment she had experienced as a child as she grew older. And she began to develop a real love for Jesus, especially in the Eucharist. She would go into the church often to pray before the tabernacle where Catholics believe the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus is truly present for all those who come to pray there. As she grew into a young woman, her aunt, who was a nun, helped her to get into a good school to become a teacher, to set forward that career, that path for her life, and she eventually earned her degrees and was hired to teach at a girls' school. Now, St. Laura, she was an excellent teacher. She did a very good job conveying good academic lessons to her students, but she did more than just teach. She introduced the girls who she taught into a relationship with God. That love that she had for God, that experience of being accepted and unconditionally loved by him, she passed that on to her students. Out of that overflow of her relationship with God, she passed on his love to her students. Now, one of her students became really good friends with her teacher, Laura, and when her student got engaged, she asked Laura to become part of her wedding party, which Laura agreed to. But shortly before the wedding, the student decided to call it off. She broke it off with her fiancé because she thought that God might be calling her to become a nun. And she told that to her fiancé, look, I can't marry you because I think God might be calling me to become a nun. Well, when the girl's parents heard that their daughter had broken off her engagement in order to become a nun, they were furious at her decision. And they actually turned on Laura and accused her because of her overly religious spirit. They thought that she had planted this thought in their daughter's head and that she had wrecked her marriage. And they began to spread rumors and lies about Laura. They caused many people to hate her and even some of Laura's closest friends didn't want to be seen with her anymore because of how much her reputation had been destroyed by these mean parents who blamed her for breaking off their daughter's engagement. So once again, Laura was experiencing rejection from those who should have treated her with love and respect. This was a constant theme throughout her life, and she once again had to return to God to remember that he had accepted her that he loved her unconditionally. And even though everyone else around her was viewing her so poorly, she was still loved by her heavenly father. In the years following, Laura found it very difficult to find work as a teacher, partly because of all these rumors that were spread about her. And she kept experiencing setbacks in her career. So a very difficult time. But in the midst of all this frustration, Laura was able to sense that God was calling her to something else, that maybe he had something more in store for her than being a teacher for the rest of her life. And while she was discerning what God's plan for her was, the Pope at the time sent a letter to all the bishops of South America because he wanted to address a very serious issue that was happening there. And that was the treatment of the indigenous people by Spanish settlers. 
And in this letter, amongst many other things, the Pope wrote this. He said, when I consider the crimes and outrages still committed against them, speaking about committing against the indigenous people, he said, my heart is filled with horror and I am moved to great compassion for this most unhappy race. And the Pope goes on to say what exactly he's so angry about. He says, what can be so cruel and so barbarous as to scourge men and brand them with a hot iron, even for the most trivial causes, often for a mere lust of cruelty? Or having suddenly overthrown them, talking here about what the Spanish colonists were doing to the, to the indigenous people. He says, after you have overthrown them, you slay hundreds or even thousands in one massacre wasting entire villages and districts, slaughtering the inhabitants, so that some tribes, as we understand, have become extinct in these last few years. So we can tell from the strong words of the Pope what exactly was happening in different parts of South America at this time in conflict between Spanish colonists and indigenous tribes that lived in that continent. The natives were having their land stolen, They were being unjustly punished with cruel torture. They even faced massacres at different times. And even when these other atrocities weren't happening, at the very least, the native tribes were always being viewed as not fully human. They were compared to animals who lived out in the forest by the racist colonists who looked down on them with disgust. Now, many of the indigenous Colombians at the time were not Christians, but they still worshipped the old pagan gods that their ancestors had worshipped for years. Gods of rain and wind and sun and moon. And even though some missionaries had been sent by the Catholic Church to tell these natives about Jesus, there had been very few converts over the years for a couple of different reasons. One major reason is because the indigenous people didn't trust the Christians. Why would they? The Christians were often treating them in a terrible fashion. The Spanish were not kind to the native people, and so the native people wanted nothing to do with this Spanish god. Another reason that many of the indigenous people didn't want to become Christian is because some of the missionaries wanted them to first look and act like Spanish people before they would share the gospel with them. So they wanted the natives to dress like them, to live in houses like them, to learn the Spanish language all before they would tell them about Jesus, which the indigenous people weren't interested in doing. They had their own culture, their own uh, styles of clothing, their own way of life. And the missionaries refused to meet them where they were at, refused to introduce them to Jesus within a context that they could understand. And so it was within this whole situation of racial tension in Colombia that God finally brought clarity to Lara for what his plan for her life was. She began to experience this call to serve the native peoples as a missionary, to go to the indigenous tribes of Colombia and overcome the hatred that existed between them and her people so that she could bring them to Jesus. When she thought about them, she wrote in her journal, I felt like a mother with three or four hundred thousand lost children. She thought of them as her children even before she had lived amongst them because her heart was moved by their plight. She was disgusted with the way that her people treated them, treated them like animals, and she mourned over the fact that they didn't know the one true God, that they followed after false gods that couldn't save them, couldn't bring them the happiness that they were looking for. And so Laura went to the local bishop, and asked him for permission to go and serve the indigenous tribes of Colombia. She told them what her plan was, that she wouldn't make the natives come to her as Spanish people, but that she would go to them. She would live amongst them. She would talk with them. She would meet them where they're at, live in their villages and communities, and speak to them about Jesus in a way that they could understand without forcing them to change their traditions and their culture. And the bishop, when he heard this woman talking, he agreed with her. He saw that God had called Laura for some great purpose. And so he gave her permission to set out 
for the native territory that she wanted to go live in. And so she left the city with four other women who felt the same call that she had. And these were the very first sisters of the new religious community of nuns that Laura would begin founding to do this work of bringing Jesus to the indigenous Colombians. Now, when the women arrived in the first native village and they began building their makeshift home on their property, the natives viewed them with suspicion. Of course, you can imagine their their confusion about what was happening. Who were these strange women who had come to live with them wearing this strange clothing? They'd never seen such a thing before. Most of the Spanish colonists just wanted the Colombians to be out in the jungle away from them. But this woman had come to live among them. And they wondered to themselves, what could her motive be? Like, what does she want to get from us? What's, what's her plan here? But Mother Laura and her sisters began to slowly earn their trust. And one of the reasons they earned their trust is because they treated the indigenous people like no one else ever had. They viewed them with with honor, with human dignity. They didn't treat them as, as animals that were lower than humans. They treated them as equals. They treated them as, as children of God, as those who bore the actual image of God. They treated them with the honor and respect that they deserved. And the sisters also respected the natives' traditional customs and way of life. They didn't try to make them dress like Spanish people. They didn't try to make them learn Spanish in order to hear about Jesus. They met them within their own cultural context. They didn't try and lord it over them or make it look like their culture was superior. They met these people where they were at. And so after a while, the indigenous tribes began to trust these holy ladies, especially when they saw the miracles that were taking place in their village through the prayers of Laura. And Laura was truly a miracle worker. When the sick were brought to her, she would cure them by giving them just a drink of water. No medicine, no drugs, no treatment. She would just talk with them, give them a drink of water, pray with them, and they would be miraculously healed. And the sisters spoke with such passion about this God of theirs that the natives began to listen to them. They spoke to the natives about how God loved them, had created them, that he wanted these people to live with him forever in heaven, but that because of the sins of humanity, they had been distant from God. They had separated themselves from him. They had chased after false gods, false idols. And that as a result of that, God had sent his son Jesus to become a man, to die on their behalf, so that they could be reconciled with God. And that in order to receive the salvation, they needed to believe in the one true God of the Christians, to be baptized into his church. And the more they talked about this with such passion and devotion, many of the natives came to believe them. They came to believe that Jesus truly was the one true God. They began to ask the sisters for baptism in order to become Christians. But the main reason that they believed in the sisters was was not because of their arguments, was not because of, of the logic of their theology. It was because they saw God's love being witnessed to them through these nuns. They knew that these nuns cared for them. And so they trusted them and then they began to trust in the God that they served. Laura also had a great love for the blessed Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, She knew that Mother Mary wanted to be a mother to the Colombian natives as well. And she often told the natives in their conversations about the love that the Heavenly Mother had for them and how much Mary wanted them to know her son Jesus. There's this one amazing story where she was trying to talk with a man about becoming baptized and he angrily told her, I don't need baptism. I don't need your God. I don't like your rules. And in an effort to win him over, she said to him, well, you don't even like Mary, my mother, because she told him about the love that Mary had as her heavenly mother. And the man sheepishly admitted, well, yes, I guess I like her. And so it was from that launching point of being a child of Mary, of experiencing that motherly love from heaven, that people's hearts were actually softened and brought about conversion 
a conversion that no amount of arguing could do. Laura's prayers to Mary were so incredibly powerful that they worked some of the most amazing miracles together. One of the most amazing miracles that Laura worked through the intercession of Mary was when a man, a native man who had helped the missionaries, died before he was able to be baptized. And so Laura gathered with her sisters to pray a rosary for him before going to bed. And the next morning, that man who was dead the night before was alive and well walking around the village. And some natives testified that they had seen Laura wake him up, which if you can imagine what that was like to wake up a dead man, I don't know what it was like. But the natives said that they swore they saw Laura wake him up after praying a rosary for him. And this man was now alive. And so it didn't take him long to be baptized after that miracle and become a Christian. And news of this resurrection spread like wildfire through the region so that even more native Colombians came to Jesus and became Christians. Now, despite all of the good work that she was doing, Laura made several enemies even among her own people. For one, she helped the natives stand up to greedy landowners who couldn't steal from them as easily as they could before. And so they hated this holy nun because she was empowering the natives and giving them the human dignity that they deserved. But there were also many racist Christians in her city that thought she was a waste of time. That to share Jesus with these natives who they viewed as less than human, as animals, they said, what are you doing, Laura? You're wasting your time. Even, unfortunately, sometimes some priests treated her with disrespect because of her work amongst the natives. But Mother Laura ignored all of them. And she just continued to serve the indigenous people, live amongst them, and serve her new community as more and more women were joining her to work alongside her for the salvation of souls. Now, through their love, their service, and their preaching of the gospel, many Colombians came to know the Lord and become Christians. They left their false gods behind and they found salvation, joy, and peace in Jesus. And when she was in her 60s, after many years of serving in the village, Laura contracted a disease that left her body swollen and in intense pain all the time. Eventually, it got so bad that she was confined to a wheelchair, unable to walk for the last nine years of her life. Until finally, after years of intense suffering, Laura died of her illness at the age of 75. Now, one of the things that I love about St. Laura is that she was treated with so much rejection in her life, And yet she still allowed God to heal her heart so that she could love others. She didn't let the lack of love in her life make her embittered and resentful, which she very easily could have. She lost her father. She was abandoned by her family. She was slandered by the families of her students. She was judged by people all through her life for her work amongst the native Colombians. But in all of this, she chose to love. She chose to love tribes of people that others thought were unlovable. And the only way that she could do this, the only power that she had, was because she had experienced the love that she craved from God her Father, from her Blessed Mother Mary. She was loved by heaven. And that love empowered her to love others. And maybe you're listening right now And you feel a little bit like Laura did. Maybe you feel rejected or unloved by those who really should have been there for you when you needed them. Maybe you grew up with parents who were ignoring you throughout your life. Or maybe even were absent. Maybe you didn't know who your parents were and you felt that orphan spirit that Laura felt as a child. Maybe you felt left out or betrayed by your peers. Maybe you felt abandoned by your family. Maybe you went through a relationship breakup that left you feeling used, unwanted, unlovable. And maybe that's left you with a a lie in your heart that says, well, there's no place for someone like me in society. I don't belong anywhere. No one wants someone like me. 
Well, all of these are lies that need to be answered with the truth. And the truth is this, that God never rejected you. That God loves you right where you are with an unconditional love. That he's chosen you to be in relationship with him. That he wants you more deeply than anyone else could ever want you. And because you know that God loves you, you can then make that decision to love others. You can accept the love that Jesus has for you because, trust me on this, Jesus came to earth to die for you to prove just how deeply he loves you. This was the love that Laura had experienced. This was the love that brought healing to her heart. And it was out of that love that she was able to bring his love to others. So let's pray right now that we would become saints on fire with love for God like St. Laura was, so that that same love can flow through us to everyone who we encounter. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Laura, you had a heart of compassion for the indigenous Colombians. And that heart of compassion led you to go and live amongst them, to share the love of God with them. Help us to imitate you in fighting racism wherever we see it, fighting the sin of racism and showing that it has no place in our world and no place in our church. Help us to meet people where they're at like you did instead of forcing them to be like us and give us a desire above all else that everyone we meet would come to salvation in Jesus, the one true God. Laura, you had a deep love for our blessed Mother Mary. Help us to turn to her with all of our struggles, all of our prayer intentions, trusting that just like she worked miracles through your prayers, that Mary could also work miracles in our own lives through her intercession before her divine son, Jesus. St. Laura, you experienced hurt and rejection. And right now, through your prayers, I want to pray for all those listening who feel abandoned by their families, those who feel fatherless, those who were bullied, those who were left out by society, those who are craving love to this day and yet never seem to find it. Laura, help them experience the totally free gift of the love of God that is so real and so true. St. Laura Montoya Upegi, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.